Welcome to Insight Analog Photography Radio Program. I'm your host, Scott Shepard, and of course, the Insight Analog Photography Radio Program is all about traditional process photography. We talk about instant photography. We talk about black and white. We talk about color film. We talk about dry plate, wet plate, you name it, alternate printing processes, everything going on in analog photography. And of course, the Inside Analog Photography Radio Program is brought to you by Fujifilm over at www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional. They have beautiful C41 color neg, black and white, color chrome, and of course, instant. Instant film rocks. These guys have so much great things going on right now with instant film. Of course, they have the pack film in three and a quarter by four and a quarter and four by five. Color, black and white, high speed black and white. But you know what's even cooler? They have the Instex cameras and film. The Instex Wide is in the country, available everywhere. And of course, right now, brand new, the Instex Mini is now in the U.S. They have cameras. They have film. This Instex Mini is two and a half by three and a half. It's the size of a business card. This is really fun stuff. You got to check it out www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional making life more colorful. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab, the place to send all your film to get developed, proofs, you name it. They got a great workflow going. www.richardphotolab.com, DR5, for the most unbelievable proprietary process to turn your black and white film into positives, into chrome. You won't believe until you get your film back as a piece of chrome will blow your mind. The dynamic range, the latitude, it's just unbelievable stuff. Definitely check it out www.dr5.com Iger Studios Lenny Iger the place to have high resolution scans done you know a lot of people now are shooting analog they're using a high resolution scan they're making digital negatives on an inkjet or maybe they're going straight to an inkjet output but they're making digital negatives and they're printing contact prints they're doing all the stuff you need to get a high resolution scan they're using an Aztec Premier 8000 PPI adjustable aperture They can give you scans that are basically grain-free. They can adjust it for every kind of film out there. This is crazy stuff going on with Lindy Iger and the guys at Iger Studios. Check them out, igerstudios.com. And, of course, Upstrap at upstrap-pro.com. The camera strap that will not slide off your shoulder. Our media partners, www.apug.org, the analog photography user group. The place on the web for all things analog process. This is a great place to learn, to share information, to get tips and tricks. The community for analog photography, www.apug.org. And, of course, our photographic philanthropy partner, George Eastman House International Museum of Photography and Film, www.geh.org. The place to go to find out about the history of traditional analog photography. These people are keeping this alive. They have over 7,000 cameras in their museum of everything that's ever been made, including the Hasselblads that were shot on the moon. You name it. They have the collection. This is a great way to help support. You can be a member of George Eastman House organization. They have a lot of great things going on, but this is something you can do to help give back to photography, to help keep traditional analog photography alive for generations to come. Definitely check them out, www.geh.org. This week on Inside Analog Photography Radio Program, we're going to have with us Taj Forer. Taj is a photographer, teacher, editor, He's been doing a lot of great stuff. He has many, many, many of his photographs in museums across the world. He's been published in many, many very cool books. In 2008, he was the PDN 30, and he is the founding editor of Daylight Magazine, a award-winning biannual publication of contemporary documentary photography. Taj, how you doing today, buddy? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for joining us here on Inside Analog Photo. Great to have you on the show this week, and I just really appreciate it with just some beautiful photography and a lot of great stuff you're up to. So, Taj, give our listeners a little background on yourself. I mean, you're a great photographer, you're doing tons of color work, but you're also teaching and you're running a magazine, you're doing a lot of stuff. Yeah, I am a busy guy for sure, but it seems like that's a common trend among photographers trying to figure out a way to make it all happen. But yeah, I started photographing as a child. It's sort of a cliche story, but I literally found an old Nikon knicker mat with a 50 millimeter lens in the basement at my folks' house. I pulled it out, and I went upstairs, and I was like, hey, Mom and Dad, what's this camera? And my dad said, oh, I used to fool around with photography when I was younger. That's a great camera. If you want to play around with it, you go right ahead. So we went over to the camera store, got a roll of Kodak Tri-X black and white film. I think it was 400 ASA, the classically forgiving beginner's film stock. And I shot my first roll of film and was just immediately immersed in the process of making photographs. And the high school I went to had a little dark room, so I started taking photo classes in high school. 
just strictly 35 millimeter black and white sort of early intro style, all handheld work. And I just really fell in love with it. I went on to study photography at Sarah Lawrence College where I studied with Joel Sternfeld who is a dear friend and mentor of mine to this day. That's when I started making color images. It was just like the veil was lifted and all of a sudden I was able to produce the photograph of the world as I saw it in color. And I've just been in love with color photography ever since then. So I studied there, focused most of my studies on photography in color, like I said. Switched to medium format, was shooting primarily square negs. And then I graduated from school, and just before graduating, had started Daylight Magazine with another photography student from Sarah Lawrence College named Michael Itkoff. And we started the magazine sort of as a result of frustrations that we had as young photographers trying to get our work out into the world, graduating from a photo program, sending out portfolios to publishers and galleries and magazines and not getting a response from anyone feeling really frustrated, and we just recognized that there was a real need for a publication that would highlight the work of great emerging photographers. So we put the idea of publishing our own work on the back burner and hell with it. We'll just make our own photographs and continue to pursue our own interests photographically while we try and get this magazine off the ground. So we identified a few photographers we invited to be part of it. We raised a little bit of money, just enough to really pay for the printing, and we got the first issue of Daylight Magazine published in 2003. It featured the work of Alex Soth, actually, his Sleeping by the Mississippi series. It was the first publication to ever feature that work, and it was right before he blew up. So all of a sudden, we started getting some attention, and we got the funds together for a second magazine, and things got serious at that point. So we realized that in order to bring a readership to Daylight Magazine, we really needed to publish the work of some very established photographers. So we would select the theme for the publication, invite a few big-name photographers who were working around that subject matter, and then we would research very extensively and sort of curate these publications that would bring an informed audience to the work of the emerging photographers by virtue of the inclusion of these great masters. It's been off and running now for over six years. We're going to press, actually, this week on the next issue, which will focus on imagery from Afghanistan. So for the last six years, it's been a constant balance between my own production of my own work and the work that we do with Daylight Magazine. But it's all related. The work I do for the magazine is certainly informative for me in producing my own work. So while working on the magazine, I went on. I did a master's degree in fine art focusing in photography and have been showing my photographs in galleries. And I had a book of my work published a couple of years ago and working on a second book now. So it's a busy time, but luckily I'm doing what I love. So with the magazine, you guys actually have a press printed book. Is it a print on demand? How do you guys do the magazine and deal with different aspects of publicating this type of photography book? No, it's the real deal. I mean, we print four color offset on Heidelberg presses. We have extremely high imagery production standards. We work with some really great folks who help us do all of our back-end color separations and file prep to make sure that they're going to just produce exquisitely. We work with Greenberg Editions. They're in New York, and they do a great job, and we work very closely with them and the press. We do tremendous amount of proofing during production process. The reproduction standards that we have are extremely high, and that's something we've always maintained. And that has really helped us gain credibility within the photography community because the folks recognize that Michael and I are both photographers first and foremost. So we know how frustrating it is when our images are published in a magazine and they just look awful. It's really demoralizing. It doesn't represent the work, our vision. So we do everything we can as editors to maintain very, very high reproduction standards. But yeah, it's distributed on newsstands. It's at Barnes & Nobles and Borders. And then we work with several sort of smaller niche distributors that help us get the magazine into all the good museum bookshops and independent bookstores, college campus bookstores that have good photo programs. And then we also do a lot of online publishing as well, which has been something that we've begun to emphasize heavily in the last 18 months. So we do a monthly editorial feature of a single photographic project which is basically a free download. It's an extended slideshow of a portfolio of images by a photographer. In most cases, we work with the photographers and they narrate their own works. So you have access to their voice and sort of the backstories behind the images that were produced. 
and it's been great. It's been very liberating for us because there are certain confining aspects of print, just like there are of web-based publishing projects. And the two really work hand in hand, and we see tremendous reciprocity between our online programming and our print programming. Do you find that in today's scope of what's going on that printing a published book is still important compared to just making this a PDF like a lot of people are doing? Because you look at all these magazines that keep dropping off the face. Condé Nast just killed a bunch. Everybody's killing off their print. you find it still a viable option to make a print book? I do. I mean, I'm a firm believer in print. I think that while there are many beautiful and appropriate applications for photographic images that are not print-based, photography is inherently a print medium. I mean, I'm a traditional guy. That's why I'm on your show right now. I am an analog photographer working with film, making prints. But even beyond that, the finely printed photography book has been a staple for the photography community. And the way that many photographers think about producing a body of work, I believe, is often still rooted in some kind of a goal for a standalone photography book that really represents the entire series. So I believe there is a place for photography publishing and that there will continue to be. I think things are changing right now drastically. Most of the biggest photo publishers have slashed their publishing program significantly, reductions of over 60%. So if they were producing 100 titles last year, they're only going to release 30 this year. I think it was like 66% of the titles that Steidl had been publishing in 2009. So yeah, it's kind of a scary time, but I think that there was an adjustment that was needed. I think that the market had been saturated with poor photography books and really poor standards for reproducing images. And in a way, I think that it's a blessing in disguise that some of the publications that were around are not going to be around in the future, because I would hope that the projects that really do gain attention and are published are the projects that will stand the test of time are truly significant projects. So I do believe there will continue to be a market for the photo book and for the fine photography magazine. I know I treat my photo books like fetish objects. I'm a huge photo book collector, and I couldn't live without them. Now, with your magazine, is it revenue based on advertising income? Is it a subscription-based deal? Is it funded by grants and foundations? How do you guys keep it alive? It is funded primarily through subscriptions, through newsstand sales, and heavily subsidized by grants. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And the organization that we started called Daylight Community Arts Foundation that serves as the publisher for Daylight Magazine does a whole bunch of programming around photography. So we do some community outreach projects. We've taught workshops in inner city schools. We've done a bunch of self-representative photography projects where we distribute cameras to members of communities that are feeling that they're being misrepresented by media journalists and curated exhibitions from the images that civilians have produced through these types of projects. So all of that work is funded through grants. And so we do a lot of fundraising, and we really rely on the broader photography community to support this outlet for work. And it's all about raising awareness in order for it to continue. But it's been great. I mean, folks really value the publication and really value the website and all of our online programming and seem to be into it. So we just hope that we're able to keep going despite the bleak landscape in in photo publishing. No, I think it's great and beautiful work, and I think people should really go check out what you guys are doing with the magazine because it is very cool. Cool. Well, I appreciate that. So now let's get down to the important stuff. Your photography. What actually got you fired up to say, you know, I want to be a photographer? Yeah, well, I mean, finding the camera in my parents' basement was just the very beginning. And it was having a camera, having access to a dark room, and then having people in my life who I respected and admired telling me that, no, you're not crazy for pursuing this. You can make a living doing this. You do have a creative impulse, and you can't deny that. You've got to follow it. And so my photography teacher in high school had an amazing photo book collection. During all my free time, my lunch hour, I would go down there and just pour over these photo books. So I was constantly immersed in looking at these great photographic projects. And I can't explain it, but I just really, really fell in love with the whole kit and caboodle. Making images, looking at images, talking about images. It was in college when I was studying with Joel that I realized that this is what I really was going to pursue. I accepted it. It was a challenge. I mean, many people I knew were going off to be doctors and lawyers and business people. 
that seems to be a model that is very pervasive, and those of us who try and follow these creative passions are often perceived as doing something stupid. But I've got to say, I'm a happy guy, and despite all the struggles, I'm really glad that things have turned out the way that they have and that I'm able to pursue my passion of photography as my work. So what brought you to do more color work than black and white? A lot of people are always like, oh, traditional, I want to do black and white. I see in black and white. I this in black and white. But then we live in a world of color. So, Right. Well, I began paying a lot more attention to color photography when I was studying in college. As I mentioned earlier, I had been producing black and white images for several years. And then it was almost as if something just clicked for me. In my early color work, I had really been making black and white photographs on color film. And there was something that wasn't really happening, that just wasn't really working. And then I remember over the course of a couple of weeks, I just sort of started seeing a little bit differently. I started reading some color theory. I started thinking about the way colors inform other colors within the frame. And I began to make images specifically because of their color rather than an image that I was drawn to a space formally because of the shadow and because of the way the objects were catching my eye. But there was nothing spectacular about the color in that image or the lighting within which I was shooting. And I recognized that sort of fatal error. And I think many people to this day photograph what should probably be in black and white using color film. There's nothing truly unique about the way that the color is perceived and depicted in the photograph. And so that was a real turning point for me. And that's when I just went full steam ahead with my color work. I do still shoot some black and white, but much less of it. I'm just seeing in color photographically, and that's what makes sense for me. So I guess I don't really mess with that. I just follow my instinct. When you're doing your color work, is it your composition and what you're shooting based off of color, or is it based off of composition and what you see, and it just happens to have color? Well, that's a good question. First and foremost, I'm always drawn to the subject of the image. I mean, whether that subject is a human subject or whether it's an object or a space, But it's always what it is that I'm interested in photographing that dictates my decision to make an image. Once that decision has been made, I begin thinking and really looking in color. I'm moving around and I'm seeing the finished print hanging in the studio. I'm figuring out how it is that I need to make this image such that it is an interesting color photograph as well as an interesting photograph representing the subject matter that I was initially drawn to. But it's always the subject matter first. I mean, occasionally, I'll produce a purely formal image just because something spectacular was happening with the color. The light was right, and there were a bunch of objects that, when perceived together, had this fabulous color play going on. And I've definitely made those images. But 90% of the time, I'm making images because of the subject matter. I'm a very sort of conceptually driven photographer. Having said that, I do work within a tradition that would most commonly be referred to as a straight photographic tradition, a more documentary form of image making rather than constructing narrative. I find narratives and I document them. But color is a huge part of my work, and I love for each of my photographs to be tasty in terms of their color, yet also explore what it is that I'm actually trying to engage on a conceptual level. So let's chat about color acquisition. What do you like to shoot to get your color? I pretty much exclusively shoot Kodak film stock. My favorite being the natural color Portra film. It just has a beautiful registration of color. I find myself working with a quieter, softer color palette in most of my work. I'm really drawn to this quieter experience of the photograph. I have found that I can achieve that most effectively the way that I shoot, the way that I see by using Kodak's portrait natural color film, which I'm a real big fan of for my own work. And I also produce darkroom chromogenic prints, traditional color photographic prints, and I print all of my work on a Kodak paper as well. I find that there's just a warmth to the tonality of the images that is much more accurate than many of the other films that I've played around with, experimented with over the years. So I don't know what would happen if they stopped producing my film. I really hope they don't. But I hear they've just invested a lot in the Portra and the Supra films. And I think they've redone the Emulsion recently in the last couple of years. So clearly they're investing in certain film stocks. While they're flashing the consumer film stocks, the professional stocks seem to still have feet. So that is music to my ears. Now, you print everything analog. Do you do a hybrid workflow where some of your output's digital, 
or do you really rely on what's captured at point of capture on film? I really rely on what's captured at point of capture on film. I do recognize that there is a need to be a little bit flexible for certain applications to produce prints digitally. But for all of my exhibitions and all of the work of mine that's editioned and sold through the galleries and collections and that sort of thing is all traditional darkroom print. It's the process that I learned that I'm comfortable with, that I know in and out. I do scan all of my negatives, not only for archiving purposes, but for image reference, for applications in in print. The magazine's going to run the work. So I've got an interesting relationship with digital imaging, and I'm very familiar with Photoshop. I know how to work my images for digital output. But when it comes down to it, if I'm going to exhibit my work, I'm going to make traditional C prints. I mean, I've been experimenting a little bit with digital C prints, and I'm actually really excited about digital C printing at this moment. And I'm very open to pursuing that because it's still a photographic process. You know, we have a light exposing the same paper that I print on in the dark room but you have that added back-end control of digital touch-up of the image that I would otherwise be doing in the darkroom through burning and dodging and that sort of thing. So there are just amazing opportunities for synthesizing digital and analog photographic technologies. I think it's a very, very exciting thing, but my roots are deeply, deeply ingrained in analog. No, the reason I ask is, with your choice of film, that's a beautiful film, There's other emulsions from Kodak that have a higher contrast, more saturation, vice versa. But when you get the stuff into a digital state, even though you're outputting back out to an analog process, it gives you, as you well know, the option to do darkroom work where you wouldn't have to do it in the darkroom. Yeah. And I find, especially with color anymore, it's so difficult to find anybody that's doing optical color work. But I still think optical color has something even still a little edge over a Durst print or something of the sort. Yeah, I would agree with you. There's something about the depth of the color, sort of the range of tonality, that really is hard to approximate when you're working with digital output. I think that the technology is getting there, and recently I have seen some work that was produced on film, drum scanned, and then output via a Lambda print or digital C print. The result was just exquisite. I'm convinced it's on par with a darkroom print. And so this is an area that I think is very, very exciting. Right now, it's still relatively inaccessible. You should get time with a drum scanner and a Lambda printer. You're talking about breaking the bank every time you want to make a single print. So as accessibility to this technology increases, I'm open to it and I'm excited about some of the possibilities there. But I don't see myself not shooting on film until film doesn't exist anymore. I mean, I really, really feel that the way that I see and the way that I photograph translates to film in a way that is much more effective and beautiful than using a digital camera. Well, definitely so, and I just think that it's great to be able to have this option of a hybrid workflow because you are capturing on the preferred media of analog and you're getting all the benefits of film capture. But you have this option of the digital correction, the digital darkroom, to be able to adjust issues, spotting, dust. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do very easily. But like you said, when you get into this example to actually get high-quality work, you got to spend a few bucks on equipment and or having drum scans or some kind of high-resolution digital capture done of your film work. But I think you can still do beautiful work with film and a scan, even if you're using an Epson flatbed. And a lot of people don't have access anymore, so I really think to keep film alive, the option of this hybrid workflow is very positive. And even if you don't have the bucks, you can still go down and have stuff done at any lab, Costco, whatever. And you can still shoot on film, and you can still get a cool output. It's just a matter of, I guess, economics anymore and the availability of especially people doing color work in the darkroom. Seems to be dropping off more and more. Oh, it's incredible. And I teach photography on the college level. And it's just amazing to me how many universities are just simply deconstructing their darkrooms. It seems to be the common practice just to nix the analog photography program. And it breaks my heart. I mean, not only because I love film and traditional photographic processes so much, but I think it's a disservice to a whole emerging generation of young photographers. All of the digital tools are built upon darkroom practice. And until you've had that experience of manipulating the chemistry and toning your prints 
and learning how to control the light during exposure. I just don't see folks who are purely digitally based producing the same quality of work. I hope that I'm wrong, but as a teacher, it amazes me when students come and they say, yeah, I've had three years of photography. And I say, oh, great, let's see your work. And out comes the box of horrible inkjet prints or <laughs> the disc that gets popped into the computer. You know, I'm thinking you've studied photography for three years and this is the quality of images that are being produced. And had they had that foundational class, Photo 101 in the darkroom, and then gone on and done their two, three years of digital work, I bet we'd be having a very different conversation about that box of prints that they took up because they would understand tonality and print quality and all of these concepts that are developed through the analog process. So, yeah, it's, it's a scary thing. I'm not excited when I hear about these dismantled dark rooms at universities around the world. No, it was at RIT earlier in the spring, and uh -huh. you would not believe how their photo department has been hacked RIT used to be like a government institution when you went to the floor. It was all darkroom, hundreds of them, right? They yep. processed everything you can think of, Cibachrome machines, you name it. They had everything, right? Yeah. Now it looks like an insane asylum, and it's been stripped, and it's just done. It's horrible. They have rooms full of gear. Like, the guy opens a door, and there's like 100 enlargers. Here, you want to haul some wow. off, man? Here, have a couple. Take one with you. And it is terrible because the generation now that's been going through high school, that's in college now, that would be taking these types of classes, they're raised on digital. I mean, they think an yeah. iPhone is a cool camera. Right. And don't get me wrong. I mean, yeah. it's great to have a camera in your phone. Cool. There's nothing right. wrong with digital. Digital has its purpose. But really, I think people that are trying to learn a photographic process, like you said, you got these students that come into you and you're teaching college level stuff. And they're like, yeah. here's my disc. Look at my box of inkjets that I puked out. Not that right. you can't make great inkjet prints, but it's a whole different process. And I think even at college level, they don't teach you the art of digital printing. That has got a very steep learning curve. Yeah, I agree. I mean, and don't get me wrong, I've seen some absolutely beautiful inkjet prints in galleries. But for the most part, those photographers had many, 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 many years of darkroom practice under their belt before they started to output using inkjet. And that matters. It really, really matters. I think there's a subtlety to the analog process that is just completely lost when folks jump right into digital image production. Obviously, this conversation is rooted in the production of exquisite, pristine photographs that you and I are both familiar with from traditional photographic processes. There are incredible artists that are working with digital cameras, digital output, specifically engaging consciousness of the medium and these digital processes and producing just gorgeous, gorgeous work. But they're not attempting to produce a flawless, pristine photograph like the photographs that we've been talking about. So I love all of the advances that digital imaging technologies have afforded the medium and continue to. But I do think that when it comes down to trying to produce a very, very accurate print, from a photograph that we've captured that you've got to really have cut your teeth in the dark room to do that consistently and beautifully. Plus, too, I think there's this loss of people printing altogether. I mean, look at Kodak announced their fourth quarter earnings for their calendar year 09. They're down in the hole. I mean, one of the statements in one of the press releases was commercial printing slides. I mean, people aren't printing stuff anywhere. It doesn't right. matter what they're doing. It's just people are acquiring images digitally with their cameras and their phones and whatever. And even people that shoot film, they're shooting yeah. film, they get it developed, they don't even get prints, they just get a scan, you get a disc back and your negatives. That's all cool and all, but nevertheless, people don't print, and as you well know, especially yourself, if you don't have a print, you don't have a photograph. Exactly. So, tell me about your work. Now, you've done one book, so let's talk about that. Sure. And then, what's drawing you to what you're shooting? Okay, well, the book that you referenced is titled Threefold Sun. It was published by Carta Art Books. They're based in Milan, Italy. It was released at the end of 2007 to coincide with an exhibition of photographs from that series at Yossi Milo Gallery in New York. And that is a project that examines the influence of Rudolf Steiner's philosophical thought and teachings on contemporary American culture. So Rudolf Steiner was a great sort of utopian thinker of the late 19th, early 20th century. 
space in Austria and Germany, and he sort of touched on many, many areas of life. His work is known for addressing education, agriculture, architecture, uh, various branches of philosophical and spiritual thought. And the two most tangible representations of his work are uh, the Waldorf education system and the biodynamic agricultural method, which is a form of sustainable organic farming. There are Waldorf schools throughout the United States now. There are biodynamic farms throughout the United States. And Waldorf education is the single largest alternative educational movement in the world at this point in time. I was really drawn to Rudolf Steiner's utopian nature of his thought. He looked at society as flawed and broken and in need of repair, and then recognized that society is comprised of individual human beings. So as we try to heal the human being, we can hopefully heal society. As we can create free human beings, we can create a free society. And I love that notion. I love that way of thinking. Start on the individual level and foster this greater movement in the world around us. I went to a Waldorf school when I was young, kindergarten through eighth grade. And it wasn't until many, many, many years later that I went back to the school that I attended with my camera just for a visit and had my camera with me and I started making some images. And when I got back to the dark room and started proofing some of the images, I recognized that I was onto something. I recognized that my experience as a student in the Waldorf School had had a profound influence on creating my world views, on instilling ideals in me that I was living by. And I hadn't even recognized what a significant experience my time at the Waldorf School had been because I was a kid. And so through the act of photographing the spaces that I had existed within as a child, I began to recognize, whoa, this is really profound stuff. And so that led to a deeper investigation of Rudolf Steiner's work as an adult. I was going and sort of reading some of his lectures, reading some of the countless volumes that have been published on his work. And I was really blown away by what I was reading. I was very critical of parts of Rudolf Steiner's theories, but I was also completely drawn to other parts of them. And I decided that I was going to expand my photographic exploration of Rudolf Steiner's work by traveling the United States and identifying schools and farms and communities and individuals that are living and working and functioning around Rudolf Steiner's teachings. I began to see that the more pervasive culture that we exist within in the United States was almost antithetical to what was trying to be propagated in these schools and farms and communities. It was just this really interesting journey that I took traveling down the interstate zipping past the McDonald's and the Walmarts and then taking an exit and meandering my way onto some backcountry road. And then all of a sudden I would arrive at this farm or this school and it was as if the world that I had been a part of for the last eight hours had vanished and there was this new world that I had encountered. And I just would get into the space of making images and work and get back in my truck and drive on to the next location. So I produced a lot of images and then edited them down to about 50, actually, that were published in the monograph. And then from those 50, I worked with the gallery and we did a show of about 19 of the images, I think. And then there was also an exhibition of that work at a gallery in North Carolina. That was a slightly broader selection. I think there were 23 or 24 images in that show. A painful editorial process, for sure, to take hundreds and hundreds of images I produced almost 1,000 photographs and cut them down to 50. But that's what we do as photographers, right? We edit. We edit the world when we're shooting, and then we edit the photographs once we've gotten back to the studio and start pouring over our negatives and our contact sheets. So it was a necessary process. That was the Threefold Sun project. The book is still available. It's gotten some great attention. It's still out there. I know a lot of times photo books will be such a small press run that they'll sell out like almost overnight. And I think the total press run was between 2,500 and 3,000 copies, something like that. So there's still a few out there. What would you give as a tip for other photographers, and especially your students and people you're teaching, to do a project on a book? Should people think about doing book projects? I mean, now talking about hybrid workflows. And like you said, it, it's very important with the quality of the print and the way you guys did your book, and it was really high-end. 
But to get your foot in the door, do you think people that are experiencing a hybrid environment where they're scanning their images to do these blurb type books? I mean, there's this deal with print on demand and you could have done your magazine the same way and had them printed on an HP Indigo or a Nextpress right. or Kodak but you choose to have it done on a Heidelberg with a really high screen resolution and so forth and so on. So what's your thoughts on these book projects and doing these print-on-demand or low-run volume books? Do they help? Do they hinder you because of quality? What do you think? Right. That's a great question and one that I think about and talk about with friends and colleagues and other photographers all the time, especially with regards to my work in the photography publishing world. It's a real catch-22. The accessibility is a wonderful thing. I mean, I am a firm believer in the power of imagery to communicate. Visual literacy is a vitally, vitally important part of our culture at this moment in time. I mean, we produce images all the time. Like you said earlier, just about everyone walking around the U.S. has a cell phone in their pocket that's got a camera on it, and they can snap a picture and upload it to the Internet or put it on their Flickr page and then output all their Flickr images to a blurb book without ever touching a photographic print. And so I love the accessibility to producing a book, so to speak, is there. And that anybody with an internet connection and some images can send away for a nice bound publication of printed images that they've produced. I think that's a fantastic thing and it's a great, great service. But I will say as someone who works with a very high-end printing process on a regular basis, that it does bring the overall quality of image production down a little bit. The standards, I think, are lower than they were a couple of years ago because the photography world is saturated with these blurb books and with these other print-on-demand books. And I think that because we live in this culture of immediacy and instant gratification, that these books and these book publishing programs are obviously a great success. Having said that, the significance of producing a publication on a Heidelberg five or six color press is so great because just the expense of running that press and having the press men and women there to handle the sheets as they come off the press, the paper itself, the inks, are so expensive that the quality of the image production has got to be first and foremost. And so there is this extremely high standard that is maintained, and that's compromised with the on-demand thing. And so I think that overall, image quality is, in fact, degrading to some extent from a broader perspective. And that's a great frustration of mine. I mean, the number of portfolio reviews that I get invited to go to are growing in number as these wonderful forums for sharing work sort of gain traction. But what I'm seeing as I'm reviewing portfolio after portfolio after portfolio are these blurb books that are produced and handed out to the reviewer, a little token, something to remember my work by, and I think it's a fabulous idea. But the image quality, not only in the book, but also in the portfolio, is not what it was before these blurb books were commonplace. I think that there is a lowering in image quality standards that kind of goes hand in hand with the accessibility. So like I said, it's a catch-22. I think they're a great thing, but I also think that people need to recognize what they are and recognize their place and recognize what it is that they do that's great and what it is that does lack and to sort of embrace that rather than pretend that it's some finely printed monograph of the work that was actually produced pretty quickly and without too much thought. Do you think you're better off doing one of these print-on-demand digital books or you'd probably even be better printing an inkjet book yourself on some fine art Mm. paper compared to one of these? And the question then gets to the point is if you're showing someone work I mean, typically, as you well know, you would do a portfolio, right? I've seen friends of mine's portfolio. It's a very expensive portfolio box. You open the lid, and there's a pair of white gloves you put on. And there's beautiful prints separated by tissue paper, and it's it's almost a ritual going through the box. Right. And I know lots of photo editors and people that deal with this stuff. I mean, you go in their office, and they have, like, pallet stacks of these blurb books, and people don't even really look at them. But if you're sitting at someone's desk, and there's an actual regular portfolio book, Just a regular black, cheapy plastic book with prints that are stuck in plastic, that's going to get picked up first, then this beautiful blur book with a cool dust jacket. Do you think that these instantaneous gratification books that you can make on the cheap help you because people can actually look at it? Does the print quality really matter? Or are you better off with a little art folio thing with some print stuffed in it that even had made at Costco? 
a color print from Costco might be better off than a blurb book. Right. So let's grab your editor's thing. Besides teacher and photographer, let's just look at you as magazine editor. And people are sending yeah. you submissions, okay? And you're going to look at work. Does it matter if it's online? Does it matter if it's in a blurb book? Does it matter if someone sends you an art folio with Costco 8 by 10s in it? I mean, what's going to draw you more? Does that quality there really matter when you're showing stuff off? Or should it be the point of first impression and it better be kick-ass and perfect or it's going to go in the can? Yeah. Well, two things. One, the submissions practice at Daylight Magazine has changed within the last year because of the very, very high volume. We were accepting more submissions than we could almost keep up with. And we were getting discs mailed and books mailed and portfolios mailed. So we've streamlined that process and we now will only entertain submissions that come in the form of an email with a web link to a gallery of images online. In that email, there's a brief text that offers an overview of the project, a little bio about the photographer, and that's it. And so we get an introduction to the work, we get an introduction to the photographer and their history, we get a selection of images, and then from that, we can follow up with the photographer if it looks like a project that we're really interested in pursuing and request prints or request a blur book if they've printed one. The second thing I'll say is that I do feel that the process of putting together a book is a very, very beneficial process because it engages the editorial practice. We always engage when we put together a portfolio, but when we think about the work being presented as a book and these pages being turned and whether or not to publish images on both of the facing pages or to leave the left page white based on the images that we're working with. All of these editorial practices and thought processes are vitally important and I think often overlooked and rushed by photographers as they prepare work for presentation. So I do like the practice of putting together one of these books forces the photographer to be an editor of their work because a poorly edited portfolio, regardless of how it's being presented, is always a painful thing. Ten extraordinary, very, very tightly representative images from a larger project will nine times out of ten have much more of an impact on me than 30 images that are just kind of thrown together and offer this overwhelming look at the subject matter that the photographer was exploring. I don't have an entry point. I can't wrap my mind around it. Two-thirds of these prints are horrible print quality. Let's just edit these down. So I think some of that thinking goes into the production of a blurb book because even though they're cheap, let's be honest, it's still going to cost some cash to produce one of these things. So people are thinking about page count. They are thinking about, I've got 100 bucks in my budget. That means I'm going to be able to do 60 pages. That means I should really probably, for this work, do 30 images because all the images stand alone. Then I want some text. So I should probably leave room for contact information. All right, 20 images. And suddenly, they're faced with the great practice of editing their project down to 20 images. So I think that it can be a really beneficial thing. Perhaps the end result being the blur book isn't really what I'm after. It's the practice of editing the work and spending time with the sequencing and thinking about the presentation of the work that I'm after. But it could be that that's the silver lining. I'm not sure. So with your work, of course, the work speaks for itself. But what did you do to get your work in the galleries? A lot of photographers are very hard on themselves and say, this is whatever, it's okay, but actually it could be really good stuff. So what's your thoughts on getting work into galleries and working that end of the spectrum as a photographer? Well, there's no formula for it. There's no rule book on how one goes about making a career as a photographer, especially when it comes to the fine art world. I think for commercial and editorial photographers, there are often certain practices that one follows and it is a bit more formulaic to some extent. But for me, it just came from conversations about my work with people who I have met over the years, whose opinions I really value and admire, folks that I turn to when I'm struggling with a body of work, not sure where to take it or how it's going to be perceived by someone that's not me. And so through conversations about my work that I was introduced to some gallerists and there was one curator that I met with who suggested Yossi Milo Gallery as a potential fit for my work for the Threefold Sun series. And so it was really just working with people that I knew and that I trusted and who I admired because I was looking for feedback on my work and I was looking for a response to my work rather than actively trying to pursue a gallery. 
obviously we all want our work to be shared. That's sort of part of the process. It's producing the work and then it's putting it out into the world for the world to see. That's always been in my mind. And as I was seeking response and feedback to the Threefold Sun project, of course, as I was wrapping things up and I had finished the shooting and I was working on the editing and the gears were in motion for the book to be published, I was thinking about how great it would be to exhibit the work. That's definitely there. But it was really through the conversations about the work and trying to gain some perspective on it that introductions were made and I was able to sit down with a few gallerists and show them the work and get their feedback on it, and that eventually led to the exhibition. When you're doing your work, and let's say you're going to work on something, do you go out and just shoot? Do you have a preset plan where it's like, okay, I'm going to go out today and find me some farmers, or I'm going to go shoot trash cans, whatever. I mean, do you go out with a preset notion of what you're going to shoot, or do you just go out? It kind of depends. I used to just kind of go out and shoot a lot more than I do, and that's something that I've been trying to incorporate into my life a little bit more because I miss that. But I work very slowly, and my work is deeply personal and really engages what it is that I'm concerned with in the world and what I'm thinking about, what I'm preoccupied with, what I'm scared of, what I'm excited about. And so everything I do in life, I think, ultimately feeds my work to some extent. But I like to hone in on something that is dominating my perception of the world and my place in it and then follow that photographically. Like I said, with the Threefold Sun Project, I just got obsessed with looking at the influence that Rudolf Steiner had both on my own life and is having on a much broader community and society at large. And that was the thread that I followed that really represented what I was spending my time thinking about and where I was in my personal investigation. So generally, I will condense all of my experiences and concerns and everything into something that really is in focus for me. It's really on the front burner. And then I'll seek to produce a large body of work around that subject matter. So in that case, I'm researching where it is that I'm going to go photograph, if I'm making contact there. But until I show up, I have no idea what's going to happen, which images I'm going to make. I mean, I work very fluidly and it's an improvisational practice in that sense. I don't create rigid shooting scripts and then stick to them. I just will identify the place or the person that I'm interested in making pictures of, and then I'll go do that and let the experience of being there in that space or being there with those people dictate what it is that I ultimately photograph. So what do you look forward to in the future moving forward? Your photography, what you're up to, Do you want to do more books, more gallery shows? Is there any projects you want to shoot, take away, teacher, magazine publisher, Mm -hmm. editor? What do you want to do as a photographer? Well, I really want to just continue exploring with the camera. Like I mentioned a minute ago, I think that we only have so much time here on this earth, and we only have so many resources. Seeing as I know that I want to spend my time working with photography and exploring myself and exploring the world and my place in it with photography, I want to make images about things that really matter to me. And so I hope that in all of my future projects, I maintain that because that makes the most sense to me. I'm always trying to photograph representation of my concern, of my questions, of my searching, and I hope that's always true in all of my future projects. So that's, I guess, what I'm looking forward to, is continuing to engage that and make truly honest work. Where can people go find your work, your book, what's going on with the gallery? Of course, let's talk about where they can look at the magazine, all this cool stuff that you're doing. Great. Well, my work is represented by Yossi Milo Gallery in New York. They handle the print sales. They have the entire portfolio from Threefold Sun there at the gallery. If anyone is interested in seeing prints, they can contact the gallery. They would be able to set up an appointment if someone was interested in purchasing work from the editions series. Some of my work can be seen online. I keep a very, very simple website, and that's just tajfor.com. It's got a little bit of an overview of some of my images, but is not one of these websites where I've got every project I've ever done archived, and you can see all the images. It's just a place to come and see some of my work and kind of get an idea and a feel for it. My work is in some public collections as well, but obviously when that's going to be exhibited is at the mercy of the curator's programming. So 
so I have no idea when work might be pulled from a collection for exhibit in some of the museums. With regards to the magazine, I would encourage anyone interested in photography to go to the magazine's website. It's daylightmagazine.org, spelled traditionally D-A-Y-L-I-G-H-T magazine.org. It is a place that we have tried very, very hard to make as a resource for photographers. We publish exhibition opportunities, fellowship, grant opportunities for photographers, criticism, reviews of books and exhibitions. Like I said, we do these multimedia features every month we release, and it's just a great place for people who are interested in photography to come and spend some time. There's a purchase link if you're interested in subscribing to the magazine, or you see one of the back issues that's really interesting to you, you can go ahead and purchase that through the website. And that's the best way to get Daylight, is through the website. It is distributed on newsstands, but because we publish relatively infrequently, because each of the publications are so carefully edited, curated to some extent. We distribute on the newsstands, and then the magazines sell out in a couple of weeks, and then it's another six months before the next magazine is released. But if you come to the website, you can just order whatever you want, whenever you want. So that's really the best way to go about getting the actual print, is through the website. There are two images from my Threefold Sun project that were recently released on the 20 by 200 website. I'm not sure if you or your listeners are familiar with that website, but it's a great website. It's literally 20x200.com, 20x200.com. And it's a project that is making artwork accessible. Many, many gallery sales are prohibitively expensive. To keep a gallery in Chelsea, New York, running, just to keep the lights on, it costs an ungodly amount of money every single month. So the cost of artwork does often get inflated and it's kind of out of touch in some senses. It allows us to pay our bills and keep making work, so it's a really important thing. And if you are a collector, I would encourage you to definitely go to the gallery. But if you're interested in original artwork and just don't have the budget to spend a few thousand bucks on a print, this website, 20 by 200 is working with artists and creating larger editions of specific images and pricing them very, very affordably. So there are several different sizes that are offered. The smallest size starts at 20 bucks. So it's an edition of 200 images, and each one's only 20 bucks. So you can actually get this beautiful print that they're all hand-signed and numbered and everything else, but affordably. So if anyone is motivated and interested in having one of my photographs, I'd encourage you to go to the 20 by 200 website and check that out, because that's a very accessible way to get your hands on one of the prints. No, that's a great website, too. They have some really cool stuff up there, and the whole concept behind it is really cool. Yeah, it sure is. Yeah, this is beautiful photography you're doing, excellent work, and the magazine, and it's just incredible you can find time to do all this. But I really appreciate you spending some time with us today to chat about what you're up to, and I look forward to chatting again about other topics. And this is just great work you're doing. I really appreciate it. Great. Well, I appreciate being on the show. I think it's a great thing for the industry, and I'm glad you're doing it. Yeah, this is great stuff. I definitely look forward to having you back on the program. I really appreciate it, buddy. All right. Thanks so much. Well, there you go. Taj Four. What a cool guy. Beautiful photography. Great work he's doing at the magazine, his teaching, being involved with the PDN30. A lot of great stuff going on with Taj. Definitely check out his website, www.taj4. That's T-A-J-F-O-R-E-R dot com. The Inside Analog Photography radio program is brought to you by Fujifilm, making life more colorful over at www.fujifilmusa.com. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab at richardphotolab.com, DR5 over at www.dr5.com, Iger Studios over at igerstudios.com, Upstrap at upstrap-pro.com, and of course, our media partners, APUG, the Analog Photography User Group over at www.apug.org, our photography philanthropy partners, George Eastman House International Museum of Photography and Film over at www.geh.org. I've been your host, Scott Shepard, here on Inside Analog Photography Radio. We'll be back next week with more great analog photography. 